All right. Hi, guys. Um, thanks for coming tonight. I know we're all a little packed in here, but, you know, hey, you know, it's fun. It's, it's okay. We have fun things because it's too bad outside. I don't want anybody to get, drip, get dripped on. Um, my name is Melanie, and I'm the um, observatory supervisor. The president is visiting her grandchildren someplace else, and the vice president is virtual right now. So you guys can see Steve right here on the corner in the middle. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. And um, he's going to introduce our guest speaker and stuff. But um, you guys, I'm sorry. Well, I put in my order for clear skies, and it just didn't work. But monsoon season, is, you know, it's crazy around here at, at times. Um, but I wanted to kind of do a few housekeeping things. <laughs> if you guys are interested in choosing the restroom, the, the restroom is over at the um, at the pool building, but it is locked. So as we go on through the evening, if anybody needs the restroom, you need to ask for the key. And we're not supposed to have the key, but we have the key. So it's a secret. You know, but we have we have access to the restroom if you guys need that. Yeah. Um, Steve, do you want to talk about Alcon coming up here real quick? Certainly. Uh, thanks, Melanie. Um, once a year, the Astronomical League has okay, a convention. Got to speak up real loud, Steve, because um, this thing is at full volume. I need to get some, we need to get some separate speakers. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear? Huh? Rick's being a butt, but that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, once a year, the Astronomical League has a convention. For the last uh, two years, unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, Alcon has been put on hold. The folks working on Alcon here in Albuquerque have been struggling along for the last two years. But finally, the third time is the charm. We are actually going to have the conference. It's starting on Wednesday, July 27th, and runs through Saturday the 30th. Uh, it's a really cool thing to go through lots and lots of, you know, lectures and presentations and workshops and cool trips and t-shirts and you get to commune I mean, with all kinds of astro, astro folks. Convention. So with this club is a, is a member of the Astronomical League. And so be, this is its annual convention that they have to, around the, around the world, actually. Um, yeah. And yes, this are yeah, this this time it's in Albuquerque. Next year it's in Baton Rouge. Um, so it's my hometown. So um, what they do is they, you know, it's, it's the Astronomical League. So they have all kinds of stuff. So you know, we're members of the Astronomical League. So go ahead, Steve. Sorry, I'm like, wait a second. People may not know what Alcon is. <laughs> uh, I, my piece. I'm in charge of vendors. So I've been trying to get all kinds of folks to come on down and display your wares and uh, so forth. I was hoping to get Celestron, Mead, you know, all the biggies, but no, afraid not. But I did get a number, about a close to a dozen different vendors that will be participating. So there's a lot of cool things in the, the vendor hall as well. So so get on. If, you, if you're interested in Alcon, go on the website, alcon2022.org, and uh, sign up. And the uh, keynote speaker is Harrison Schmidt. Yes, he is. We're having a special uh, reception and a special dinner for Harrison Schmidt. So it's uh, it's going to be neat. There's some field trips and going down to the yeah, VLA. Field trips. There's a fellow who has a 40 inch reflector that apparently uh, one of the field trips is to make a pilgrimage to that 40 inch. So that should be pretty interesting. So. So at any rate, sign up, please. You still have some time, so and get online. Trips, God, get online and sign up. <laughs> we were one of the field trips. They were like, "Hey, can can we come out to your place?" And I'm like, "Sure," because I we're only I think we're the second that I know of, and possibly only the third of or, of organizations like this that that Para had partnered with the city, and we have city and club working together to have an observatory. Baton Rouge has one, and we helped put that one together back when I was living there. And then we moved out here and went, hey, these guys are way better than Baton Rouge. We need an observatory. So um, we got the, the, you know, the telescopes were donated to us. And so it's like, okay, now we need a place to put them. And so it was, you know, 10 years of my life, and, you know, trying to get it all put together, but it, but it worked. So life is good. All right, Darren, you have some White Ridge stuff? Yeah, White Ridge is the beginning of the weekend. 
which is the last weekend in July. What city did they ever tell them? It's on, it, it's on the website. Uh, that last Saturday, July. Uh, so look for an email uh, the, about, uh, approximately a week before that, that Sunday or Monday or that Saturday. I will send a reminder. Um, do keep in mind, though, this is monsoon season. <laughs> so yeah, it, right now it's 50-50 if we're going to have a stargaze. And also, too, we have any kind of rain on the days up to the two, even, even if that Saturday is clear, if you have any rain that Friday uh, or Thursday, uh, remember it is a dirt road, last five miles, and cell service is very iffy. So you may, if you get stuck, you may have to hike five miles to the highway to get a, a cell signal before a AAA will come pick you up. Bring them my boots in other words. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, all right, so yeah, so check check out the website for that. Mayor Sunday is fun day. Is August the twenty first, and we always have a booth there. Um, I have to talk to Dave Hyde. I've been out of the, you know, out of pocket for the last little bit, and I got to talk to the uh, Dave Hyde, who's a county commissioner who has been putting this on for I don't know how many years now. And uh, we always have a booth. They give us a booth for free because we're a nonprofit, and we set up uh, solar observing, and we use it as a, an advertisement for our fundraiser in the fall, which is going to be October the first. Um, Jane O'Bell is um, a planetary geologist that works at the Museum of Natural History. And Steve, um, she's trying to decide either August or October, the, our general meeting in October to find out whether, whether she's gonna do. So I'll keep you posted on what she can, when her date, when her life, you know, she texted me a little bit too. So she's like, September doesn't look so good because I wanted her for September, but that's not gonna happen. So it could be either August or October. So if okay. you've got somebody for August, let me know. And I'll say, well, then it's October, you know, so we can work together to have her come in because the October 1st is our fundraiser. And um, our, our guest speaker is going to be Larry Crumpler. He is the planetary geologist. He's, it's, it's, it's her husband. And it's kind, of, it's kind of funny. It makes me laugh because he works on Mars. She works on Yes. <laughs> it's like too funny, but they both worked on the Magellan probes and Larry has spent the last 30 years on Mars. And so he went with spirit opportunity and not perseverance. He helped put together a lot of the programming and what, what, you know, what um, ingenuity is doing. So he's, you know, he's super amazing. And he has a book that he has published just recently and it's called Missions to Mars. Uh, Amazon Smile, the Astronomy Club is an Amazon Smile member. And the way you access that is smile.amazon.com. And when you look for, look for the organization, you look for us and a portion of your purchase goes to us. So if you are interested in any of you know that kind of thing and think, hey, I'm going to buy something from Amazon, like who doesn't? Like I did last night. And, and so I, you know, that's my bookmark is the smile.amazon.com. And the Astronomy Club is, is linked. So if you want to buy his book, we're going to put a link to it on uh, the smile.org site with Larry's book. It's called Missions to Mars. And it's like $28.99 right now on Amazon Smile. We're going to buy several and have them here on hand because everybody goes, I didn't do it, you know, because it that you know that always happens. I had to give mine up whenever he talked in December because uh, they're like, oh well, they need a book. Fine, take my book, and I, you know, I haven't gotten mine back again yet, so I'll be getting that. And then, um, guys, the astronomy club, we're going to be having a planning meeting for this thing starting this month. Sometime we have everybody has assignments, but we need to start kind of bringing things together. So if you're interested in helping out with the with the fundraiser, that'd be awesome. And right before that meeting, we'll have a board meeting because we need to have some, you know, talk about a few things before that. But that's that's all the housekeeping kind of things to catch everybody up to right now. So we've got something, two things in August, our meeting with Jane, with, with Jane uh, and definitely Mayor Sunday's Fun Day because that's kind of a fun thing. But um, cool. Does anybody have any other news or questions? Cool. I have not been here since May because I was busy uh, in June. Well, so, I can tell you that I was out the White Bridge not long ago and the road was fine. Go. Cool. Okay. It's, it's actually a little smoother than it used to be. Be careful from up that last hill. Okay. <laughs> you go airborne? No, <laughs> that it. last hill is a little rough. Mm. Not like Chaco. <laughs> last time I was out there, it was a complete washerboard in my little car. I my jaw and my oh yeah, yeah. I, I guess I should mention I have a big that that was the road to Chaco last time. Oh my god, 
cruises over all that little stuff. <laughs> Lord. Okie doke. Well, if that is all on this end, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Melanie. We'll to back on again. Okay. Um, tonight we have Dr. Colson Chandler with us. Uh, Dr. Chandler studied, uh, studied math and physics as an undergrad student at Brown University. He was a grad student at the University of California at Berkeley, and he was a postdoc student at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. His research was published in leading mathematics, physics, and chemistry journals. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and a professor emeritus of physics at UNM, where he taught for 36 years, often teaching classes and seminars for liberal arts students. So with no further ado, welcome Dr. Colston Chandler. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, nice cozy place and I don't have to really yell so you can all hear me. <laughs> um, uh, the topic uh, of the evening is electromagnetic waves from the standpoint of a physicist That's too loud, guys. No, and, and uh, uh, also a little bit of history that's involved. Um, I guess I started in graduate school um, at Berkeley. I was a TA for a professor that thought for liberal arts students, it was good to include a whole lot of history of the science. And in fact, to read the original articles sometimes. Uh, and it worked wonderfully well. And it, I found it increased my understanding because the, particularly to read the old papers, uh, they were really wrestling with the problem for the first time. And so they explained things more clearly because nobody, they knew no one was going to believe them. And so the arguments were a little more potent than after a generation or two uh, of physicists that worked it over and it just seemed so obvious. <laughs> so <laughs> how many of you took physics in college? Uh, pretty good. Sure. It would have been better than philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, physics actually has its roots in philosophy. <laughs> what, rather than trying to find out what the nature of, say, man's soul sure. is, we try to find out what nature is like itself. And uh, it's taken us quite a long time to get as far as we are. And we'll meet some of the characters along the way that started. Let's see, that's a pointer. Um, the first thing that's important to realize at the title being electromagnetic waves. So then the question is, what is a wave? And all of us have seen waves on a lake or in the ocean or something like that. It's something. You know, the water goes up and down in sort of a periodic and monotonous fashion if it's not a storm. And uh, but it turns out that all sound waves, water waves, seismic waves, gravitational waves, electromagnetic waves have a certain common features to them. And so and, and there's one experimental thing that they do, the observable thing that they do that we don't have any other explanation for other than a wave. So I want to get you to the point where you know at least how physicists view what waves are. Um, the main thing is that if you have a wave, say you imagine two speakers, uh, sound waves, and, and they're sending out uh, sound waves of the, let's say of the same frequency or wavelength. And then there, they can meet at a certain place. And at that point, they, superimpose upon each other. And what they can do is they can create a, create a dead spot. That the one wave comes where the crest of a wave arrives at the same time as the trough of the other wave. And when you add them up, you get nothing. This can be seen in concert halls if they're badly designed. Uh, or if you're tun tuning a string instrument, and uh, those of you that play know that one of the ways you do is you, you finger one, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the strings uh, and then you pluck the neighboring string or you or a fundamental string and you listen for beats. The beat phenomenon is an interference phenomenon. 
And if the frequencies are very close to each other, then what happens instead of cancellation is or re total reinforcement is you get a partial thing. And so you hear the sort of the average frequencies of the two strings, but then the frequency difference between the strings determines whether it's constructive or destructive interference, zero or maximum wave. And this, if actually what happens if you had a way of visualizing the, the interference pattern, what it's doing is rotating past your ear. And so you get louder, softer, louder, softer of the fundamental frequency. That's another interference phenomenon. Is that how you get noise canceling headphones? Yep. Um, uh, opalescence and iridescence, uh, for example, crow's feathers, you know, the, the, you can see color. Uh, the black feathers will sometimes look a little bit reddish, mm -hmm. and it depends upon the angle. And what's happening is the fibers of the feathers um, form little sources of reflected light. And so these sources, the reflected light can interfere with each other and, and can emphasize the red as opposed to the blue, for example. Uh, the little eye of a peacock feather is the same thing. Uh, opalescence, you look in an opal, the kinds of colors you see there are also interference from light coming from certain scattering centers where the light uh, impurities in the opal that way. Um, dichroic glass, uh, you can go to a stained glass store and, and, and they'll have a kind of glass that has a very thin film deposited on one surface and it reflects one color and transmits the complementary color. And what's happening is the light that hits the top side of the thin film interferes and is reflected. Then there's light that goes through the top side that's reflected back over the bottom part of it. Think of, think of it as a window pane. Some light re reflects off the front, some reflects off the back. Um, those two light sources can interfere with each other and, and make colors. And that's what happens with dichroic glass, which artists use. Uh, it also happens um, uh, if you have, say, a, a pond after a rain and the oil from the pavement forms a thick, a, a very thin film of oil or gasoline. And you'll get these colors. Well, they could be different colors for different thicknesses that are there, and it's an interference phenomenon. So we're going to look at water waves so we can see them. Sound waves you can't see, uh, but they do all the kinds of things that water waves, and light waves also. Well, there's a, a picture, an aerial photograph. Uh, the main waves are coming uh, parallel to each other uh, from the bottom on the right, so they're going up toward the upper left. And they see that opening between a rock and the cliff. And look on the other side, you see the, the waves are going in a totally different direction. You got the pointer working, there it goes. Is that an earthquake? That you, that you see this curved thing. And then over here, there's another curved thing behind the rock. And in between, there's a de there's sort of quiet water. That's a destructive interference where the waves sort of cancel each other. But the other thing that's notable about this is that uh, the waves, let me find the pointer again. Here, the waves are going this way. And look through here, the waves are going that way. The waves have gone around the corner. This is what you, this is the phenomenon that's happening with sound waves when you hear around the corner. Uh, well, in the laboratory, we could do things uh, a little more systematically. Here's the same wavelength. These are straight wave fronts coming through. The bright things are the crests, and in between are the troughs. Uh, then there's a barrier, and they, these are the same thing, except for the width of the hole. And you see here, for a relatively wide one, that is wide compared with the different distance between crests, that what happens is if you went sort of the geometric shadow just straight up, you get straight wave fronts, but then there are the curved stuff on the edges. Well, if you make it a little more narrow, 
then you get this strong curving. And out to the side, you see right here, there's an, an in between, there's nothing. This is where the waves add to zero. Here they add to zero. Then here it's a little weaker. And in, in between, you get this. Over here, it's still smaller. You still way out in this direction, you'll get another maximum. But by and large, what's happened is the central region had spread out wider. And it can also happen, for example, if you go over to something like this and you just make the wavelength longer, it's actually the ratio of the split width to the distance between crests that matters. And so if you make uh, if you take a given hold, you can make the wavelength longer, then it will spread out like this does. This is called diffraction. Here's something that is a different kind of interference where the waves, you can see these waves here, but then there's these waves. So you have the waves coming from two different directions. This is the only picture of this kind of phenomenon I've ever seen on the web. Uh, but uh, you look, here between where crests are not with their troughs and so on are meeting each other, kind of flat. And here's a ridge here, but where it meet, these ridges meet, it piles up. And if this is if this is a pier here, and there's a storm that comes in and forms this kind of wave pattern, as these crests move in, these little guys can be very dangerous. They can destroy. It. As the the height, you know, there's kind of a median height, and the wave is either rising above it or going below it. That's called the amplitude of the wave. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, and it's the square of the amplitude that determines what the power of energy transport is. And I once spent uh, nine months at a university in Adelaide, Australia, and lived on the beach in the hard life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really dark sky too, right? and uh, and there was a jetty that had been famously destroyed a few years before in the storm, and what had happened to them was just something like this. It was wave interference, and it completely demolished a jetty that was 100 years old. Mm -hmm. They had to rebuild it. It's a big tourist attraction, so they had to rebuild it. Okay. Uh, here's another picture of two slits. And uh, you see here's here are the waves coming in, this kind of fuzzy area here that's a barrier and a barrier. These are the holes. And you see here, it looks like this is sending out circular waves. And then where they overlap, right going down, look here, there's something funny going on. And you have this wave source, this middle source coming out. And this actually is a little bit higher than the ones out to the side. Um, so this is a typ typical two-slip pattern or two-source pattern. Um, and this is because of, of its simplicity. This has been thoroughly studied. For how long? Oh, we'll see. Um, the key theoretician in all of this was Christian uh, Huygens, who was a Dutchman, or I can't remember whether the Dane or a Dutchman. But in any event, he was one of the very few scientists that Isaac Newton thought was worthy of, of any recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, Newton was kind of, uh, he's sort of a saint in, in physics, uh, but he was also extremely arrogant. In fact, that he thought that, that Huygens was pretty good, and said Huygens was uh, was a good deal more than pretty good. Mm -hmm. so, but he, in 1690, before Newton published his book on optics, he published this book, which is Treaties on Light. And, and he provided a way of thinking that I'm about to describe to you. And it turns out that way of thinking is still taught in elementary physics classes today. 1690, this came. What was going on here in 1690? Well, the, you know, the Spaniards had been driven out in 1680. They still weren't back here. Another two years, it would be coming back. Uh, it also happened to be the year 1690 that the clarinet was invented. 
<laughs> that happened in Germany. What was it then? Clarinet. Clarinet. And <laughs> well, uh, like many people in the early days, so little was known about what nature was like, what the physical nature was like, that almost anybody could have a huge number of firsts. And, and so the fact that uh, Huygens uh, made contributions in optics and mechanics, mechanics is a science of motion, studied the rings of Saturn and discovered its moon tight he had telescopes. Uh, he, in fact, improved on the designs of telescopes. He invented the pendulum clock. Um, 1673 idealized a physical problem by a set of parameters and then analyzed it mathematically. Uh, what does that mean? That means that you start out with some idea of, say, uh, some mathematical formula that is applicable. Uh, it's a little, but the problem is not quite that simple. So you make your mathematics as simple as you can without totally destroying its relationship with the physics. And then, and then you see if you can't solve those equations that you devise. This turns out to be a huge talent. And some physicists, like Enrico Fermi, for example, um, uh, who was involved in the atom bomb project, he was an Italian, he was famous for that. Uh, he actually uh, got a very quick uh, estimate of the yield of the Trinity bomb. He made some confetti and he made a very simple formula. And when he saw the flash of the bomb, he dropped the confetti. And when the blast hit, the confetti had dropped a certain amount to the side and he had a formula uh, relating that distance with the yield of the bomb. Now, that takes real skill. <laughs> he was famous for that. He also set up the first reactor at the University of Chicago. He did do that. Yes. And he was also the one that, indu that discovered what's called induced nuclear fission, which is you, you shoot a neutron at a, at a, a, a nucleus mm -hmm. and then it breaks apart. So mm -hmm. he was the one that, that discovered that. So. Um, uh, he was the first one actually to use uh, Huygens, getting back to him, to use a, a sort of mechanical explanation for an underlying phenomenon. This turned out to be a big deal in England, where uh, particularly with the idea of what light was, that what we now call a vacuum had a huge amount of mechanical structure, little vortexes and wheels and things like that. And, uh, that was kind of a barrier for them for a while. So, uh, and I guess I may not necessarily important, but the improvements of the telescope, didn't you figure out how to make uh, the clear glass properly? Oh, no, the, the Fraunhofer was the one that really made the clear glass. Oh. So here's, it, let's, let's now kind of walk our way through this. Here's a slit, single slit. Here comes the waves, the wave fronts. And you look right there, and there, and there, three, three points in the opening. And each one of them is emitting a wave. And waves, you can see each one is emitting a spherical wave. So I just go out along following the wave fronts. I reach a point on a screen over here where I'm going to observe. And these, these meet. And so what I have to do is somehow add all the waves, whatever that means. And when I do that, whatever the process procedure is, I get a function that looks like this. Now this is actually the square of the wave of, of, that I get here. Now here, there's nothing at all. So this means that all of these waves somehow add up and all from all the other points, you have to do it all for all of them. Uh, that, that you get zero here. And in the center, you get a big maximum and goes to zero and then it's symmetric about the center of the slit. Now, if you had the waves coming in at diagonal, then this point would be moved over and it would be not symmetric. That's how a oscilloscope, oscilloscope gets its readings from frequency. Well, what you, what you uh, hear in this case, because this is a thing about light okay. coming in. So, so this, you just look at it. Okay. And if you have a photographic film or something like that, then what you would see is you would see a, a little spread out thing like that, brighter in the center. 
falling off to, to nothing, then another bright minimum to nothing, then another bright up to the side. This gives you an idea, this is actually an intensity of the light. Right. And this is what you would actually see if you looked at it. And one of the parts of the training of physicists when they uh, study optics is to look at these things and see them with their very own eyes. And then they learn how to photograph them. And then they learn how to use CCD things. And so on, you work your way all the way. So here's a, a graph of a wave. And uh, it wiggles and it's periodic. Uh, this is this kind of the zero level. It goes an amplitude above and then an amplitude below. And so if you're standing, if the wave is in between crests, it's the wavelength. And the distance between a, the vertical distance between a trough and, cross, uh, trough and a crest is, is twice the amplitude. So this is kind of an average uh, that you're using as a reference point. So that is uh, that gives us some terminology, amplitude, wavelengths. And so here, if we have two of them, so here's two, there's one there, and there's one there, and they're exactly the same. Well, what if you add them? What you get is this. And what you do is at every point uh, on the horizontal axis, you find the value of the bottom wave and the value at the same point in the upper wave, just add them. And not surprisingly, what you get is the same shape, but it's twice as big. Now remember the square of the amplitude is what determines the power of the wave is transmitted. And if you square two twice as high, you get four. So this this means that this interference this in, in terms of power transport, this interfered wave will be twice, will be four times as effective as the single wave always. So. Uh, well, here's where the, the crest meets a trough and they add out to actually zero. That's an observable fact <laughs> with water waves. And if they're a little bit off, then you get partial cancellation. So let's go back to this. So we have this point P, and we're going to take the waves. We imagine we're, we're sitting here. Oh, and the picture of the wave, I can imagine if the wave is going back here. I think of space, for example, but it could also be time. I could be staying at a single point and look at the height of the wave. It first goes up, and then it goes down, and, it, and so on. It's the same picture. So now I go back here and I, I imagine I'm, I'm uh, sitting here over at point P and, and I just uh, add all the waves at a, as, uh, at a given time. And so these waves go here and I add them and then a little time later, I add them again and time later. And I square those results and then take a time average. And what I get is this curve here. Now, the interesting thing is that I can figure out how to do this. And uh, somebody's probably lost his head, maybe. You know, or it's spam. <laughs> your, uh, your insurance is up. Yeah. You know what? My, 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 my car is up. Yeah, yeah warranty you now. Yeah. So the, the, there is then, Huygen showed us the way to actually mathematically do all this computation. Uh, there's a slight assumption. That is that the distance between the slit and the screen is much, much larger than the wave. That, that allows you to make certain kinds of, of uh, Hmm. Certain kinds of approximations that we do to make make it possible to actually do the calculations on with pen and, and paper. Um, however, people have looked at the other cases. The uh, the case I just described, which is far away, is called Fraunhofer diffraction. And if you get in closer, it's called Fresnel diffraction. And both of those have been examined over the subsequent centuries. And so we have formulas. The Fresnel diffraction has to be uh, 
computer the results have to be uh, computed by the It's far too hard for hand calculation. So if you have two slits and you shine one white light through it, uh, you get these patterns where in the middle there is this maximum and then there's another maximum out there and then another maximum out there and they gradually get fainter and fainter and fainter. The important thing about here is that, remember I said the red waves spread out more than the, the blue waves, the shorter wavelengths. And here, what that means is a separation of color. It's white light, which is a superposition of color. And so you see there, this sort of a kind of an orange and red thinning, and then there's the blue. And over here, you're getting yellow and so on. You get this separation of color. These separ this separation was observed by Grimaldi, who lived from 1618 to 1663. It's pot, he traveled, so he might have known Huygens. Uh, but he actually, uh, he was a monk. And so what he did was to uh, sort of make a hole to have light come through a window, strong sunlight. And then he put a pole, uh, not not actually in the the uh, not actually in the hole, but a little bit toward the center of the room. But the effect was that then he could examine the shadow of the pole, and he observed this kind of pattern and observed the colors. So and he wrote it down in a lab book, which he didn't publish. But the lab book was discovered by his monk colleagues and they spent two years uh, getting it ready for publication. So that's how we know about it. Uh, I wanna jump then to, to about 1800, 1804. Thomas Young, uh, an Englishman, who worked on the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone. He did a lot of things. He was a surgeon by profession, but uh, in the 1800s, it was quite a, you know, people worked on all kinds of stuff. They weren't, uh, they made their living one way and, and then had fun uh, with other intellectual pursuits. Um, he was a member of the Royal Society and he gave an invited lecture in 1804 that uh, was published. And then a couple of years later, he gave a course of lectures on mechanics and light. Uh, that book is still in print, and it includes this as a double slit wave thing. And you can kind of see here, there's a minimum. This is an area where crests meet trough. The center area, the crests lie right on top of each other. And here is something else going on, it's kind of hard to figure it out. But as you get further out, but these minima separated by maximum. Just exactly what we saw in the previous slide in that slide. Well, this time uh, he published and he became famous. Virtually every physics student learns about this experiment. Um, well, the, Newton actually thought that light was a stream of particles because light rays, you know, you can see them. You design telescopes, it works fine. Light going in straight lines, reflecting and, and so on. And so he thought streams of particles. And his prestige at the time he published it uh, was so great that the whole of the scientific community swung over to his side. Light is a stream of particles. And the wave theory of Huygens just kind of dropped by the wayside. Well, um, gradually information, like the interference phenomena and so on, and uh, they couldn't explain that in terms of particle theory. So, but they could with the wave. Uh, so there was a, a question, uh, the French Academy of Sciences decided to hold a competition for essays about the nature of light. And you could argue either for wave or for particle. And the prize was typically a, a gold medal, real gold, that, uh, that was uh, for the winning essay. And so this guy, um, Fresnel, and you may know about Fresnel, 
the Fresnel lenses. Uh, he's the inventor of those. Uh, he uh, proposed a wave theory of light. Uh, Poisson didn't believe it, but he was a referee. And so he said, ah, well, if, if, if light is wave, then if you looked at the light through a pinhole, there ought to be a bright spot in the center of the pinhole of the pattern that the pinhole makes. Nobody had ever seen one. Well, his colleague uh, on the committee, um, Arago, just decided he would do the experiment. And he found the bright sky right there in the middle. You see it? Sometimes it's called a Poisson spot and sometimes a Poisson spot. It depends on whether you want to uh, credit the person that predicted it should be there or the person who actually saw it first. But neither of them were the first. He later discovered, Rago later discovered in the library that the observations of the spot had been published a century early by two separate people in Spain. I love it. You think you're first and then you discover you're not. And we now know that the only successful physics theories for diffraction and interference are based on waves. So if you see wave, a, a, an interaction, that's, that's you know, an interference kind of interaction. You know there are waves there. And that's, that's led to quite a few discoveries in, in physics. Well, there's the magnetic. It refers to the concept of magnetic, uh, which is literally thousands of years, tens of thousands of years old. The, uh, the word magnet itself comes from the word, from a Latin word, which was Magnus, who was a mythical sheriff, uh, shepherd in Greek mythology that discovered the, the, the uh, lodestone, magnetite, which is a natural magnet. And, and he, and they, you know, so they knew about things like that. There was a, there's a medieval manuscript uh, from Britain about, oops, having trouble getting it. Uh, written, what did I say, about 1190. And this guy was English. And he described the use of magnetized iron needles as compasses for navigation. What the sailors would have was a string, probably a thread, and they would hang a needle, an iron needle, on the end of it, haul out the trusty lodestone, which is a permanent magnet, tap it against the, that so that the iron in the magnet became magnetized. And then they would step back and watch what the needle did. And one end was painted red, or some other color. You tell one end or the other. And so the needle pointed north and they knew where north was, which was wonderful if you're navigating on a cloudy day or at night. Well, at night you bet that it was uh, not cloudy, you would be able to Stars. Think about that, 1190. Already they had done some studies about the, the magnetism. Not so long after that, uh, this guy, um, French, uh, did a more extensive survey. And one thing he did was he made a spherical magnet which he, using iron, which he did magnetize with a lodestone. And he made iron needles, which he magnetized with a lodestone. And then he laid the needles on the surface of the sphere and just let them do what they would do. And what he discovered was they kind of all lined up in lines, except there were two places where the lines cross, which he called them the poles, in analogy with the Earth's poles. And he realized that here that that he was seeing sort of something like the Earth, uh, and he also argued he must have made smaller and smaller magnets to discover this. They always have both a north and a south pole, no matter how finely one cuts them. Always a north and a south, never a single pole. A single pole would be nowadays called a monopole. 
and uh, and it's kind of a holy grail if you can find one in some experiment. Then your name as a great science physicist is, is sealed for the ages. But no one has ever been able to put it, and it's not for one term. <laughs> well, far beyond Nobel Prize. <laughs> it would win the Nobel Prize, but the fame would go much behind that. Now, here's William Gilbert in 1600 published a book which was the first really systematic study of magnetism, scientific study. And, uh, and he knew about, uh, about the Maricourt study. Um, this book is still in print, by the way, published in 1600. At the time, he was the physician, the personal physician of Queen Elizabeth I. And when she died three years later, King James I renewed his appointment. But unfortunately, he died a few months after. So, so people, there, and uh, reading the, 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 the preface to that book is interesting reading because he was just vicious in his criticism of philosophers who would not do, who did not trust the experimental method of inquiry of nature, it was just vicious. Uh, uh, René uh, Descartes, that's a, a Hals portrait of him. And he published um, two books on nature. And this is a drawing from one of them. Here's the earth with magnetism, mag magnetic fields lined up out here. And here are some other lodestones sort of shows how they would disrupt the magnetic field. Now, he could only have gotten this through experimentation because he didn't have any theory to, to do that. Um, so, the, but the point is the way they lined up, you have this idea of there's a line there and they always are kind of pointing to the, along the line, these little needles. So this concept of magnetic field is quite old. And uh, velocity uh, fields also. You have a water flow, and, and you imagine what is the velocity of the water at a given point and a given time, then it's something that points in a certain direction, the direction of motion of the water at that point. And you can imagine a little arrow pointing in that direction. And the length of the arrow could be the speed. And that, that little arrow with the speed and the length, that would be called a velocity bit. And that varies according to the position in the floor and the time. So that would be another example. Here there's an electric field, whatever electric field really means. But anyway, it has a direction, magnetic field, has a direction, has a strength. And here's the, the common thing. You're seeing bar magnets with uh, the poles, just north and south. And you just sprinkle some iron filings and they kind of line up in lines. And here, some lines are drawn to help the eye. The, the lines sort of start at the North Pole and go around and end at the South Pole. And uh, you can also do it just without seeing a whole bar magnet. They didn't have these. Here's what happens when you have a North Pole and a North Pole. And you have these field lines kind of in here. You know, they seem to repel each other. And that's associated with the fact that the North Pole and North Pole repel each other. In fact, you can feel it. You try to hold it together. Um, well, the remarkable thing discovered in 1820 was if you have a, a, a wire, a current in a wire, and you bring a compass needle up close to it, the compass needle is deflected. It doesn't, you know, you hold it far away, it points north. When you bring it up close to the current carrying wire, it does something else. And this picture here is a picture of, whoops, the current is in this vertical wire here, and all around are the iron fires. Oh. You see, they're arranged in a circle. So the field lines are a circle. Um, it was uh, Erstig, uh, who, uh, uh, Dane, who discovered this 
the legend is he discovered it in the midst of a lecture. He was trying to show people that that electricity, electric current and magnetism had nothing to do with each other. <laughs> and so he moves it up and says, oh yeah, well, everything is here, I'll just show you. Uh, that's a myth, but it makes a pretty good, uh, pretty good, pretty good story. Um, so that, given the, look at his dates and so on, so you have to realize that was probably an early daguerreotype. He looks like he just ate something he didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so he was the first one to found a connection between electricity and magnetism. And up to that time, it had been thought they were completely separate from each other. There was no connection whatsoever between them. He was also the one that first used the German term uh, Gedanken experiment, which is um, a thought experiment. And that turned out in the early days of, of well, Einstein and the founders of quantum mechanics. He used these thought experiments over and over where you think about an experiment and you imagine what would happen if you did it. And uh, rather than writing an equation down, you just use your intuition what's going to happen. And that guides your, your, guides your uh, use of mathematics. Well, there's the electro part and the, the concept of electric field is generally accredited to Michael Faraday, who is an Englishman. Um, they're very much uh, an analogous to iron to, to uh, magnetic field lines. And in fact, um, fairly early on in my teaching career, I was thinking, well, if you can do with iron filings, there must be something that was similar, responded to electric fields in the same way, that had the equivalent of a positive charge on one end and a negative charge on the other. They're called electric dipoles uh, in physics that was naturally occurring. And then I forgot how I ran across it, probably reading a magazine about teaching of physics, grass seed. Grass seed is normally that way. It just comes out. And so what you can do is do an experiment like this. And so this is a glass plate. Uh, there's a wire coming down with a little puddle of solder. Another wire coming down in the puddle of solder. In this case, this has a negative electric charge. This has a positive or vice versa. And look how the grass seeds are lined up. It's almost to make you know, almost makes a believer out of it. But this stuff is really true. And this is what happens when they have the same charge. You see how they start out, and then they sort of the lines kind of go out to the side. And this is, this is the same charge, like charges repel, unlike charges attract. Uh, Faraday was born into a poor family and apprenticed a bookseller and, and, book, uh, and book binder, was 14. And uh, his apprenticeship was six years. Uh, he you know, they didn't have money, his family didn't have money to send him to school. There were no public schools in those days. Uh, so he, he, but he uh, was really, really smart and he wrote uh, in his spare time, he um, read books he found around all, all the world. And he began uh, attending lectures at the Royal Institution and the Royal Society. These are two different authors. And they gave lectures on science. Uh, those lectures were kind of a, we don't have a, a similar kind of thing, but science in those days didn't involve as much mathematics. And so, and, and so people could come and they could learn about scientific things of scientific interest and feel like they understood it. Uh, as Faraday, uh, in fact, was famous as a lecturer of this kind. And he would pack a lecture hall, mainly because he was probably one of the greatest experimenters ever in physics. And he would bring all this apparatus and he would have a show about how stuff worked. Uh, in any event, uh, so he never had any formal, uh, uh, Faraday never had any formal uh, education, but in 1832, when he was long in years, he was uh, given an honorary uh, doctor's degree from Oxford. So finally, he was Dr. Faraday. But he didn't live a lot longer. He married a woman uh, 
who was a member of a fairly conservative uh, offshoot of the, the uh, Church of Scotland. And uh, he was became a devout member of that church. And uh, one of the things that's interesting was part of it is a little bit like Quakerism in some respects, that uh, you were to do good and follow your life without look without seeking reward. And 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 in fact, you shouldn't be rewarded. You should refuse rewards. That was greed. So uh, the kings wanted to give him a knighthood. He refused it. Uh, he was such a great man that they wanted to bury him in Westminster Abbey, where Newton was buried. He said no. But after he was dead and buried where he wanted to be buried, they put a plaque here in the Westminster Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I can see it. This is this is where Michael Faraday should be buried. <laughs> I'm sure it's not worth it. Let's see. Oh, another thing. Uh, Faraday kept a picture of uh, Einstein kept a picture of Faraday on his study wall. He had a picture of three people: Schopenhauer. Faraday and Maxwell that we'll talk about it. Well, here was his famous experiment. This apparatus, uh, he, uh, he uh, used, it's, a, it's like a, a coil from old fashioned car. But remember, this is the 1830s. And so what is here, this is an iron ring and this is, a coil of wire wrapped around it here. And this is another coil of finer wire. So he, 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 in other words, there are more turns of the wire. Here. And so he gives a pulse of current through here and discovers there's a pulse of current through the other thing. That's called magnetic induction. And so what is happening here is this electric current creates a magnetic field. Well, iron likes magnetic fields and it will steer the magnetic field over here. And so the, the magnetic field and no magnetic field, and suddenly there's a magnetic field. And what it's doing is generating a current. The electric motor. And generate. Yeah. So this is a really big deal. Yeah. It sort of turns the loop. A changing magnetic field can generate a current. A current can affect a magnetic field or create a magnetic field. So uh, I, I wish I'd known, I didn't know this until I prepared this lecture. Uh, I've been in London a couple of times. I might have just tripped over there to the Royal Institution to have a look at this thing, see what it looks like in person. Do you know how big that is? Uh, and it's not very big, I'm sure. It can't be more than that. Uh, but the interesting thing is about the same time in the United States, uh, Joseph Henry um, was an interesting kind of guy. He came from a poor family of immigrants, um, but he sort of was educated. And look at this. He, um, he served as first chair of natural history at the College of New Jersey, which developed into Princeton. And after that, he became the first secretary of the Smithsonian Institute. And he was there of the order of 30 some years. I can't quite read it from here. 46 to 70. So 32 years. That means that there was nothing when he started. He started the research aspect of the institution. He started the museum aspect of the institution. He started the library. At the institution. He started it all. Pretty amazing. Yeah, <laughs> and he also, interestingly, he, he was good with his hands. Uh, he had a contract once with Yale University to make an electromagnet, the most powerful in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. he, he's the one that made it. So where are we, uh, and by this time, physics has decided that electric charges generate electric fields. Magnetic poles, which don't occur except in north-south, generate magnetic fields. So there's a kind of parallel structure. 
Electric, electric currents generate magnetic fields. Changing magnetic fields generate currents. Electric currents are electric charges in motion. Now, before there was any discovery of an electron or anything like that, so we knew exactly what the charges were, it was clear that uh, from experiments that charge moved from place to place. And that's they knew what the current was. And what was lacking was this general theory, systematic theory that connected all of this stuff. And there was a reason they didn't have it. There turned out to be a missing piece. That little bit of technology right there is a big portion of what runs in most every vehicle in the parking lot out there. You betcha. Wheel speed sensor, crank position sensor, cam position sensor, all that stuff. That little break in magnetic field creates a small electric charge that your computer can. Well, the break in in in, uh, uh, in electric. Let's see if you, you think of field, yeah. generates a small bit of electricity that the computer and the car reads. That's yeah, in the old days when you, you had spark plugs and so on, yeah. and uh, that, that was the way of like, generating yeah. the coil would generate mm -hmm. the spark. Mm -hmm. um, as, well. I actually made uh, for a liberal arts <coughs> class. I made a laboratory where I took the ignition parts off of a, a Volkswagen. The beetle okay. <laughs> and the shop sawed them in half so they could see what was inside them oh. and we put it on a board and they were they could make measurements they could turn a crank and, uh, to get some, some current flowing and instead of that and so on. Um, I thought it was pretty cool with students <laughs> <in German. laughs> Maxwell was born in Edinburgh to in a, to a comfortable situation and it turned out that uh, when he was like three years old, Intense curiosity and a prodigious memory. Can you imagine the mother? Mm -hmm. The kid is following along behind and he never forgets anything and is always wanting to have an answer of this or that. So she can't wait to move into a house that has a garden so she can push him out the door mm -hmm. <laughs> and so on. Just, you know, he studied at the universities of Edinburgh and Cambridge and uh, 1856, he took a position at a Scotch college, but then he went on to King's College in London, and after a hiatus back in Scotland, where he wrote his book about electromagnetism, uh, he went uh, to Cambridge University, and he was the he was the first ever Cavendish professor of physics, and he was the founding director of the Cavendish li uh, uh, Laboratory, which is one of the biggest most famous physics laboratories in the world. And he created that from scratch. Um, his, his famous equations in the form of partial electricity equations firstly appeared in his textbook, A Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism in 1873. That book is still in print. And it's used as a textbook at St. John's College. <laughs> for the students who are taking their mandatory science class. Um, unfortunately, uh, I really feel sorry for them, but I once <laughs> talked to a graduate who went on to become a professor of computer science and she claimed that that was the best way ever to learn about partial differential equations. But she was ignoring all the physics side of it. Most of a good deal of it was not true. Um, now, uh, Oliver Heaviside was a self-taught mathematician and physicist and made his living as a telegrapher, because telegraphs were on by that time. Uh, but he invented the modern form of Maxwell equations, which I'm gonna show you. And as I mentioned, Einstein had a picture of Maxwell, only one of three. So here are the famous Maxwell equations. I'm just going to tell you what the letters mean. The E is the electric field, and it has a length, Think of it as a little arrow, it has a length and has a direction. The B is the magnetic field. This del is uh, called a gradient operator. It's a calculus operator, but uh, it's the gradient operator. So it, it looks at the slopes of things. So the rate with space that, uh, that something is changing. And, uh, and so here, what, uh, what this is basically saying, this is the law, this leads to Coulomb's law of attraction and repulsion between, between charges. And this is, a, it doesn't look anything like this. this. This is the electric charge density. This is a constant of nature. Nobody knows where it comes from. <laughs> it's just a constant. 
uh, since there aren't any electric charges, then we got zero here. But look, the, this thing is the, is the same. And so not surprisingly, before the connection between the two sub electricity and magnetism was found, the mathematics was the same. And so that's the reason these field lines could be found so easily. Uh, now this curl thing, the, the thing with the cross, this is another differential operator that has to do, uh, it usually in, in fluid flows, it usually has to do with a vortex kind of motion. And so this would say some source, uh, the magnetic field changing would create a circular kind of electric field structure. And uh, so, for example, if you have a, a loop of wire and you, you crank up the magnetic field in the middle of the wire, you get a current. Uh, and this same thing happens with magnetism. The field line there, here's, remember the picture where the field lines went around the current? Well, here's the current. And it's giving a swirling kind of magnetic field line. Now, here's the thing that was new. This thing here is called displacement current. And there are various stories about how Maxwell got to this. One of them is that he just really believed he wanted waves to come out. And so he tried all different kinds of stuff until he found that term would do it. And so uh, when he calculated, and he, when he could calculate them after he was done, calculate that he had wave structure, and that was a prediction of the existence of, magnet, of electromagnetic waves. Uh, others say that there were other reasons for doing it, but this thing is called displacement current. And if you think about a capacitor, which is one plate, metal plate here and a metal plate here, you start charging up it, this plate and you know, the charge goes up. And, and so then the, the, that drives the charge away, the negative charge here. And, and that drives the, the electrons out of the metal on the other side. So they, other plate becomes positively charged, so you positively build it up. But in the gap, so you have a current in the ex in the outside, but no current in the inside. But it it looks like there ought to be a current, and and so he invents this current and figures out that it has this particular mathematical form. But that that then says okay. Let's do an experiment. Let's put a really small current meter inside the capacitor. And we'll just see, is there anything that looks like a current in there? That's been done. But it took a while. The current is very small. It took a while. So there's the term. Difficult. Look at this date, 1929. And here's the title. So on Journal of Physics and Radio in those days. And well, if you've got a current going in there, surely there's a magnetic field. So you've got to put a magnetic field direct detector, very small and tiny. You've got to put that in there and see is the magnetic field, what the current should be generating. And that was recorded uh, in 1985 by two Americans. Um, of course. This is of interest of historical interest and so on, but but nevertheless, you know, these dangling threads really know it. <laughs> and, and if you think about field, magnetic fields being known in the 1200s, and you're still working on it in 1985, that's a long time for people to remember. And we can remember because of libraries. So be sure to support your local library. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, it was a theoretical prediction. You saw some equations and it looks like waves. And so the question is, are they real? And Heinrich Hertz, uh, who got his PhD from the University of Berlin in 1880, uh, he studied in, in Dresden and Munich. Um, and uh, if you're coming from a prosperous family and you don't have to earn money, then you can hop from university to university taking whatever you want to take. And that's what he did. And finally in Berlin, he found somebody to supervise a degree in, and he got his PhD with it. Um, 
I'm not going to, the, the, the actual experiment itself is really hard to explain. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to do it. Um, but in any event, while he was a professor of Karlsruhe, uh, which is now the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, he performed a series of experiments. It was a, a series that took about three years to do. And uh, the problem was, how do you detect an electromagnetic wave? He had to invent that. Which he did, and uh, uh, and then, but he also measured the speed. He measured the polarization, the magnitude of their electric fields. Uh, so this put everybody on board. The old particle picture of, of light of Newton was then dumped in that trash can. It was a wave. The electromagnetic fields, including light, the waves. Well, uh, of course, what you noticed this is kind of a picture. The, imagine this is the electric field. And if you think about uh, this as a picture at a fixed time, then it has this wave-like structure as you go to larger and larger. This is the direction of propagation. First it goes up and then down and versus direction comes back and the electric magnetic field uh, is perpendicular to it and so on. Now you could imagine the magnetic field coming out the other way. That is against Maxwell's laws. Maxwell equations tell you what direction, relative direction of the two points. This is what's called linear, a picture of linearly polarized electromagnetic. Circular or polarized you get by having that whole pattern just rotate around the axis of propagation. And go one way or one left or left or right, right? They're opposite direction of rotation. And elliptical is kind of a, a mix of um, of uh, two circulars, where they're not quite in phase <laughs> each other, and you can make that stuff. Okay. Uh, you've probably seen something like this somewhere along the line. Uh, here is increasing wavelength. Is this direction, and you can see the waves are getting further and further, or the crests are getting further and further apart. The energy of a given wave goes the other way. And down here are the radio waves, AM, FM, TV, radar, uh, here's infrared here. This tiny slice here is visible light with red with the longer wavelengths, violet. Where would microwaves be on that scale? Um, microwaves are down in here somewhere. It's one meter, let's see, centimeter. Uh, right, right in here. Microwaves are about two and a half. The, the, the microwave for your a uh, kitchen microwave is about two and a half centimeters. And then gamma rays are out here and x-rays are in here. Uh, ultraviolet up here, that's what does uh, bad things to your skin. Uh, well, when x-rays were discovered, the question is what were they? And this is the guy, uh, Max Lally, uh, his, his father was uh, made a noble in the old Germany. And, and so he again put Fawn in there, so Max Fawn. Um, and he uh, made a diffraction pattern. This is like a two slit interference pattern, except it's many slits. And these are all from his Nobel Prize lecture. They're all from copper sulfate. Uh, this was the first one. <laughs> and actually, as they learned how to do it, it developed into this. So this is a fairly common, uh, and one of the things, if you go to the Nobel lecture site and, and so on, and you go to the year of a person, then uh, if you, uh, there's sort of a bar a little bit from the top, and if you click on summary in there, you can, you can actually find the text of the Nobel lecture. But more importantly, you can find the text of the presentation speech. As you see, the way the ceremony went was that the um, that the uh, 
recipient of the prize sits there in an audience with the king of Sweden. And so somebody presents this to the audience. And then he goes up and he receives the prize. And there's a banquet afterwards and he gives this lecture. In the lecture, he's supposed to explain his idea that led to the prize and so on. But the presentation speech is to a general audience. And so I recommend those to my students. They can be very, very good. And in this particular case, I went to his lecture because I wasn't happy with the picture. The first picture I found was this, and I discovered he had these other things, and he explained what they, how he got them and what they did to make them better and better. Um, that's a modern picture of, of an aluminum crystal. Now, the interesting thing about these is you get one of these things. This is aluminum, and so the, atom, the atoms are known. And, and so the actual geometric shape of the, the array of dots is determined by the crystal structure. But the brightness profile, if you go and study the dots themselves, that depends on what on the atom. Now that's inter really interesting because you can do the same thing with a crystal of DNA. And by studying the spots, you can get an idea about the structure of DNA. And so that's what was done here, the array of the spots, but also the shape of the spots and so on. This is the picture that led to the double helix idea for, uh, that, uh, for DNA. Uh, this is the woman and her graduate student that actually made the picture. And these are the two physicists that were given access to the picture without her knowing about it. And they figured out what it was and they got the Nobel Prize. She went on to, uh, rather than doing DNA, she went on to image proteins and viruses. And it's, uh, she died of some cancer at a very young age, as you can see there. And, uh, and so, you know, dead people can't get Nobel Prizes. So, virtual. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, here it has to do the atmosphere. Uh, the yellow curve is if you didn't have the atmosphere, this is the spectrum of light. So uh, here's the UV, there's a visible, here's infrared here. This is how much, this is the intensity of that light that would reach the surface. Uh, however, you do have the atmosphere, and so the red gives you an idea of the intensity. Namely, there are some of these wavelengths where none of that wavelength reaches the surface. And others where most of it does, and the visible here, most of it does. So for sure, if you're building a telescope and have put a camera on it, you don't be low, want to look on the surface of the Earth. You don't want that wavelength. Um, to avoid all of this problem, there's a reason you put telescopes in space. And there's the most recent one. Uh, this is a James Webb telescope, and uh, so here's the Hubble primary mirror. So you see it's about three times the size of the Hubble. Yeah, yeah, and here's a person. Now they're hexagonal, and they had to do that because they needed to fold the whole thing up. And, and so the hexagonal ones are something and I don't, didn't bring a picture of how it was folded, but it was quite interesting. Notice, however, that uh, not only the mirror is hexagonal, but so is the whole telescope. Now look over here. See the spikes? Remember the, the single slit patterns? And it turns out a single slit, if you have a double slit, a single slit pattern modulates the double slit pattern. They're just products of each other. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have this effect here. This effect, the spikes, have to do with the shape of the mirrors. <clears throat> and, uh, and for example, you, you get this constructive interference out here. But the point of it is the light has come in and some of it has spread. 
and along the vertical axis through the middle of the telescope, you, you have every mirror is going to contribute to that line, mm -hmm. every one. So you look at the axes of symmetry and you'll, you'll see that the spikes are along the axes of symmetry. And that ends my talk. Professor, through fine tuning though, will we not have those web images look like what we see in our telescopes here? They're going to uh, more or less focus, focus the, the images because they have small motors that they can use to move those hexagonal. Oh, this uh, has been this has been this is from the Spitzer uh, Space Telescope, by the way, of the Sin Stars. Oh, and so you see, it's a pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, no, this is this is there. They have already done all their fine tuning, okay. except except what they have here. They can take them out with the computer. They not only can, they will. Stuck with the spikes. The spikes still take. Them. Well, I mean, but you're also stuck with an image that's obviously substantially more clearly defined. Yeah. Minor change yeah. in quality. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to put glasses on it like they do. We had Deanna draw her here and talk to us from you and him. Yeah. She's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this is an extremely interesting one. In fact, they have one of the instruments that finally is completely uh, vetted and can start taking data. And they say within the next two weeks, they expect to be happy some results. Mm -hmm. And, you know, NAF NASA really wants to publish those pictures. Yeah. So as soon as they have them, it's going to be in the news. I've heard they're excited about them. Yeah, right. But what they see coming off of it right now, so. Yeah. Well, these are stars. They they wanted to have as close to a point source of light as possible, and so they looked at star fields. But now they will start with deeper things. And that reminds me of another thing. Uh, you can see uh, at the wavelength there, it's about uh, seven point seven microns. Um, you know, so seven point seven millionths of a meter is the wavelength of the light they're looking at. And the main reason they chose the two main reasons they chose it. First of all. Dust is a little bit tra transparent to this particular wavelength. A lot of dust throughout the universe, so they can avoid that. But most importantly, the red shifted light from distant galaxy galaxies then becomes visible. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that, you know, you take a, uh, an atomic emission spectrum that's in the visible, and it will redshift down to that wavelength. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's been stretched so far by the gravitational distance and so on. So that, that's, that was the real motivating factor. Make it big so it can, you can get something to detect faint light and operate it at a wavelength that would be appropriate to, to objects that are as distant to in the universe as you can get to. They believe they can reach almost the cosmic microwave factor. So the last few hundred thousand, years, the first few hundred thousand years of the universe. Oh, the wall. <laughs> the real I'll case. believe that. I'll believe that. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? Yes, sir. What's interesting, you're talking about, about capacitors for the displacement current measurement, because I was wondering if you're familiar with a concept called the Casimir effect. Yeah, yeah, this has nothing to do with that. Okay, <laughs> oh, uh, I, I, okay, it doesn't. But do you uh, agree that the Casimir effect generates energy from zero point field? Uh, well, the problem the problem is that uh, basically the Casimir effect is a quantum fluctuation of the vacuum. Right. And what you call it and how you interpret it depends very much on what you think the vacuum is. Okay. And that's a, that's a subject that is not settled yet. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Steve, do you have any questions online? I don't have any. Uh, anybody else? I, Thank I, you, I Mark. Something you danced around. I think might be. A uh, future good future topic. And what is that? Wave, wave particle duality. Ah, I have in fact once tried that. Well, I, I gave the talk to Oasis uh, quite a long time ago. Two, it was a two, you know, two lectures a week apart, and uh, and the question was, is light a wave or a particle? 
that was the motivating question. And uh, I had the advantage of uh, being in a, a university where optics was a big deal during the 70s and 80s, when a lot of the experiments were being done on that subject. And um, the definitive answer to the question was, if you say, is light a wave or a particle? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> The electromagnetic spectrum is a function of space time continuum itself, or is it a particle or wave, or how many dimensions uh, it may have, like three dimensional? Or the ways that do they have more than three dimensions or more? Well, there, there you're moving out into the realm of, of philosophy when you talk about, um, you know, there, there are a lot of people that have worked on the, the basically the Maxwell equations and four space in one time dimension, so a total of five dimensions. And it turns out in that space, you can unify Einstein's equations with the Maxwell equations, except that nobody has ever detected that extra space dimension. Where is it? And, and, and also there are all kinds of things that happen in there where you can have a situation where the cause comes after the effect, that sounds like a very mm. peculiar philosophical mm. thing. As if I heard a Star Trek Voyager episode. Science fiction writers have a yeah. certain, you know, leeway and they can make interesting things. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Would love to talk to you all day, but everybody would scatter really quickly. But um, what was I going to ask? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> If the Higgs field imparts mass upon particles or people or any macroscopic object, or more fundamentally the subatomic particles, do you believe that the Higgs field imparts mass, for example, on a photon? Uh, nobody has been able to detect it. People have really looked to see whether the photon has a mass. Every result, experimental result is consistent with zero. Right, but it's momentum. So. Yeah, and this, and the interesting thing about an electron, there have been many people who try to measure the size of the electron. All the measurements are consistent with zero. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> so you know you can interpret this in a variety of ways. Just wait for a little more technology, right? Uh, there's another uh, assumption called the collapse of the wave function in quantum yes. mechanics, where do a measurement, the wave function uh, changes instantaneously to something else. Nothing in nature changes instantaneously. So the, that's obviously an approximation. But then how fast is it? Um, just within the last year, I read a paper uh, of people who worked with the photoelectric effect, and they found that the electron came off the surface, not instantly upon the inst from the laser pulse coming. But there was a delay of about five attoseconds. <laughs> I don't even know how many. Yeah, it was it was zero. Zero. yeah. that is really, really small. <laughs> and you have to be able to measure it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have one more elementary level question if that's all right. So Faraday and the Faraday cage, did he actually invent the Faraday cage? Was it just named after him? Or I think it's named after him. Okay. And he was kind of a device-oriented guy, and electromagnetic waves, the Faraday cages screen electromagnetic waves, right. was invented in the waves notion that okay. came after he was dead. Okay. So, okay. So, so yeah, that's on. The, the most interesting Faraday cage I've ever seen was when I visited the MEG installation at the VA. You know, that magnetic encephalography, you put little squids on yeah. people to detect the, magne detect the currents, yeah. of the, uh, or you detect the magnetic field generated by the currents in the brain, yeah. and so on. Uh, it turns out that the Earth's uh, magnetic fields can really mess up the things, so they, they have to, to and radio waves coming in yeah. and all that. So that's in a super duper. Uh, Faraday cage okay. with mu metal all around too to get out there is wow. But they, they can tell the difference if somebody has been an iron mine worker, for example. Mm -hmm. They come in there and he's got so much iron in his lung that it just lights up the wow. Uh, huh. 
And you can you can see when he reads it out, they can see it. <laughs> that's right. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. It's, it's, really it's really sensitive. And the interesting thing is that um, MEGs are spatially um, not all that great. And so you need to combine them with uh, uh, a scan, an MRI, which means you get the geometry just perfect. And then you, uh, but the thing that the MEG is good at is detecting uh, transient time effects. The, the MRI is not good for that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this allows possibility of, it's yet another thing you can do for a diagnosis as to what the shape of the emitted electromagnetic waves is like and what that means and so on. And you can also, uh, uh, when you think about positron emission spectrum, uh, then that, you have to get that pulse just right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It is interesting yeah. stuff. I just was reading something interesting about the uh, the web telescope with the adjusters on it that they have to adjust it after micrometeorites impact on each mirror. Oh yeah, to keep the waveform. Yeah, yeah. So and it, they just had a shower up there. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> so sorry. They, they got a, they got a chance to what they discovered was. That, the damage was more severe than they thought. Uh, it, was going it, to it was interesting that it, it's not just one time focus and it's done. It has to be done yeah, over and over again. Over and over again. Yeah. 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 Like, I'm to do yeah. 16 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That was very enlightening. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. We just, okay. Yes. Very cool. We were just in Italy earlier and I took a picture of, of, of uh, Barry's um, tombstone and I can't remember where it was. It's like, oh my God, I'm just trying to find it. Tammy worked in Rome. Yeah. yeah. And he's buried in one of the one of the churches that we visited. Like there's one yeah. of the churches in Rome. And yeah. I'm like, I got, yeah. I got it. Well, the other thing, the other thing, if you're if you're going to Florence, there's a Galileo museum. Yeah, we, well, we missed that. And one. Telescopes like, oh, like you wouldn't believe. I know. We were like, <laughs> we told you all over nothing. Unless you want to go home, but did you know the story of the gentleman who first? Estimated the speed of light, calculated the speed of light. It was from, I don't remember, his rumor or something like he, that. Yeah, he was an astronomer. Yeah, he, he, he looked at the, the, uh, at the uh, circulation of the bones of Jupiter. Oh, right. yeah. Wow. yeah, he was off about five or 10%, if I remember exactly. right. But that was a great deal, yes. better yeah. than anything before that. <laughs> Yeah, and that was in about 1750 years. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was uh, well, it was right after astronomical telescopes were invented, and I think of um, not Galileo, but I think of uh, of Newton and um, it was Kepler actually worked on telescope designs as well for the, that would be used for astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, and that was about you know Kepler was right in 1600. You can probably stop recording, Steve. Okay. Thank you, folks. And I will shut her down now. Check, Rob. Oh, somebody asked me something about the glass. Uh, 